I'm Eric Holdeman, and welcome to Disaster Zone, a show about emergencies and disasters that can happen at any time and anywhere. The media is one of the main users of drone video these days. If you watch any disaster event, you'll see aerial drone footage. And today we're talking with Greg Thies, the production manager uh, for King 5 Media Group, and he's also the lead drone pilot uh, at King. And Greg, thanks for being on the show. Great to be with you. We've been wanting to do this for about six months. News keeps getting in the way, doesn't News it? gets <laughs> in the way. And uh, I think you were sick <laughs> getting in yeah, the way. Yeah, with you know, just about everything. <laughs> yeah. So um, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. We've had a couple drone shows already, one okay. just with an amateur guy who shoots real estate videos, did my garden. There you go. You know, uh, I, I hope you had Cisco helping yeah. you with that. No, no. <laughs> okay. And then uh, another drone show on you know, how to start a program, really more agency specific. So sure. this is gonna be a, a general, but really speaking to what you do day to day and what the media does. So um, why don't we start out, you know, what's the depth and breadth of drone usage here in the Seattle metro market by media? Yeah, uh, you, quite honestly, it's uh, grown and gotten more organized since uh, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, King has a drone program. Uh, the uh, couple other TV stations have it, another uh, a group, Como, has a drone program very similar to ours in, in not just locally but on a corporate structure. Okay. Uh, the uh, a couple others are, are, they have pilots that have their own aircraft uh, and, and use them, maybe not as organized on a, on a, a company or, or a, a, comp or a nationwide are those basis. people? No, most everybody is using their own drones. Uh, okay. As far as, as news media broadcast TV goes, okay. there, there are others that probably have, uh, uh, if you want to, how big you want to make the word media, but basically of the four TV stations, that's kind of how it lays out. Goes back maybe a couple years now? Yeah, and that, and we, you know, a lot of that has to do with what the FAA set up for, for commercial drone operations, yeah. and that dates back to the uh, summer of 2016. Okay, and that's constantly changing. It, constantly, it, even and as it's we still are changing, right, yes. Right. So, uh, what about in the national television media market? I'm, I'm, you know, admittedly, I watch. NBC News, I've watched it since I was 13. And they're putting a lot, you see a lot of drone video. A in, lot of drone especially video. Especially in their breaking news. They've got, they've deployed a number of drones and, and I know that some of their NBC uh, photojournalists actually operate, uh, folks that I've worked with uh, at national events in the past, some of them are actually drone pilots themselves now. It's a great tool, to, as we call it, to, for storytelling, for right. gathering news, not just the you know, a 15 minute long piece with drone video. It's just to get that good shot to help give, bring a perspective. So right. it's getting used by a lot of folks. CNN is a, a big leader in their aerial uh, division in NBC as you, we were just talking about. And I, I'm always interested in the disaster yes, aspect, yes. that story. And typically, you know, they're using that. They, uh, we'll get in more to the rules and uh, that they have to follow on that. But yeah, you know, why don't we talk about your professional background and duties as it relates to drones? I mean, drones is just a, one small piece of what you do, right? Yeah, I, I'm a photojournalist by trade. Long time, been here in the Seattle market for 35 years. Uh, and have worked uh, at, mostly in the last uh, number of 20 years or so as an operations manager, supervising photojournalists and the behind the scenes okay. things. So when drones came on the scene, uh, uh, it kind of fell a little bit toward me. I had a great personal interest in it okay. and and so uh, I've got my remote pilot certificate and then that that kind of uh, worked along with where the company was going and trying to uh, build their program. You know one of the things that people don't realize here in uh, Seattle we're kind of a, a helicopter hole I call it there aren't a lot of helicopters in the region not, not only media but I mean the city of Seattle doesn't own a helicopter and people outside you know coming from uh, other areas of the Midwest or back east, you know, find that hard to believe. There aren't a lot of helicopters. What do we have for helicopter resources for the media today? It, it has changed. And no? it, okay. I mean, you bring up a very good point because I know we've had uh, discussions over the years when we've worked with uh, emergency management folks here, how the news media helicopters filled in a big need yeah. uh, in that sense because there weren't a lot of aerial platforms right. with public service, uh, public safety agencies. Um, but the number of media helicopters has declined, they've condensed. Yeah. Uh, we used to have uh, each TV station here in town, at least three of them had, heli uh, had helicopters. Uh, uh, Portland was the same way. Mm -hmm. um, now that's reduced down to two. 
uh, uh, King and Cairo, uh, excuse me, King and Como uh, operate their uh, a joint aircraft. Uh, they have a contract to work together, and then uh, uh, with an outside contractor, and then Cairo has their own aircraft. So there's only two helicopters here now in in the market. So drones can play an ever increasing aerial view platform for providing footage. Of what's going on? And that's that's extremely uh, valuable. Beca and it gives a different perspective from a helicopter that usually is up at, you know, 1,000 or 1,500 feet. Uh, it is a different perspective, as you said, when you look at a, a disaster or some major news event, as we've seen on national TV and locally, those, uh, you get a little more intimate look, a little different uh, perspective at it. And, uh, it. and for smaller markets, for, you know, go outside the region, and even if you're a Tri-Cities or you're a a Spokane where you didn't used to be able to, you, nobody can afford a helicopter, let's go out and rent one, a drone makes a great platform for both regular and breaking news. Okay, and you know, what I recall, it's a little bit old, that you know, it costs about two and a half million dollars to buy a helicopter, <laughs> and then it's about, then the operational it costs, yeah. about <laughs> two million a year for fuel, maintenance, parts, and, uh, fuel, oh, yeah. and the Absolutely. staff, so. It's, a, it's an expensive operation to run. Yeah, and I, I know you're on the TV side of things, but do you th ever think radio will use a, a drone type thing just to improve their knowledge, information, the old news radio format, or probably not, because they can't, but, you know, they're... Uh, you, always ask, you know what, we yeah. always get asked when we post drone video, yeah. why isn't there any sound? But yeah. Of course, all you'd hear is the buzz, but yes. but but I, you know I think from their from that perspective, I mean the question is like it would be a, a, maybe an information gathering tool, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. I'm not sure how else, or maybe for something for somebody who can't. Uh, perhaps you're a couple blocks away, and you're a radio yeah. reporter. I can see where it could be beneficial, perhaps if you're trying yeah. to describe a scene you can't see, but you right. can see it from the or air. Yeah, broadcasting on the internet. Yep. they can provide. And, and then, of course, yes, that, that doesn't mean that they're not allowed to show the video. media landscape is changing. Very true. Too, right? <laughs> yeah. How about you know the drones you're using? I, uh, what most people are familiar with are these small quadcopters. They, they cost about twelve hundred dollars. The Phantom Three or what? Whatever yeah. you can go buy them. But yeah. there's a bunch more. So what what are you using? And I'm interested. Do you use any fixed? Wing. We don't use any fixed wing. At least uh, we don't. There's nobody in the market region. Uh, most of the uh, interactions I've had regionally and also on the national basis, whether it's at a conference or symposium, uh, most folks, and even even outside of media, you know, whether it's agriculture, uh, power utilities, most of them are not into the uh, the fixed wing thing okay. yet, like you'd see in in uh, some industries. Uh, or perhaps, you know, defense or something, a, a large brush fire. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of the wildfire management agencies, they do have a, uh, the ability to use a fixed wing to get over a large landscape, but none of the media okay. folks. But we use uh, a couple different variety of aircraft. We use a, a larger quadcopter, uh, the Inspire series. Uh, it's a quadcopter, doesn't have uh, eight rotors like some aircraft that doesn't carry, we don't carry payloads, we carry a camera. We don't have to worry about sensors for, uh, uh, picking up things. The, uh, some of the, I think, public uh, safety agencies, you'll see larger helicopters or perhaps utilities or whatnot. We use an Inspire, and actually now, now uh, we use Inspire a much smaller the aircraft. brand name? Or Inspire's a, a model from, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, the, the one big manufacturer, there's a lot of manufacturers yeah. you mentioned out there, okay. the one big manufacturer is DJI, right, right. and that's an Inspire series. Okay. It's a fairly large aircraft, but um, and it, it works well, but we, we've actually gone to where most uh, uh, folks, the, the probably prosumers, if you want to call it, real estate, uh, whatever, we're using right. a Mavic aircraft now. We actually have uh, several Mavic 2s, and that's where a lot of uh, media folks are going, not just having one aircraft that you got to haul a big case out and put it down on the ground and, and whatnot, uh, more of a, a smaller, easily deployed aircraft that you can get either into a, a zone uh, and not, uh, and also maneuver better and has better obstacle and uh, avoidance and safety features. Yeah, oh. How long can they stay in the air? Well, the Mavics, actually, the new Mavic 2s that, that, that are out there are, uh, can go up to about 30 minutes. The Inspires, uh, uh, actually, by the time the batteries are, you know, we, we change out batteries. They, they're every, it's almost like, you know, it's just like any other aircraft. Uh, and not to get too deep into it, but there are maintenance logs and periodic maintenance and preventive maintenance. So you're changing out props, okay. batteries to make sure things stay healthy. But you'll probably get 15, 20 minutes. If on a windy day, that aircraft is keeping itself, uh, it uses its internal computer to keep itself in place most of the time. So it's 
depending on how much wind's it's blowing. Eat, it's it can, eating juice. It can eat juice, it. yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Typically, you just have a camera on it. It's a pure optical device. Do you have any infrared capability? We don't, and we could. Uh, and if actually, uh, you know, of course, that comes in very valuable for, for public safety folks, for, uh, as I mentioned, agriculture or utilities who are looking for hot spots. You can put uh, different sensors on. We, of course, are looking Here's for pictures. Visual. We're looking for visuals, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, how many drones are in the inventory, and then how many operators do you have? Because not everybody, you're 24-7 no, Yeah, we, we are. Uh, we, we have a one large aircraft, the one Inspire. Now, when you Inspire. say large. I, I'm sorry, me, I say large. Yeah. To us, it's large. There, there are large, much very large ones. It's probably, you know, probably a few, few bread boxes. 24? Yeah. Or so, okay. and uh, but you know it's it's about ten pounds, whatnot. The Mavic aircraft we have uh, uh, three more of, and we'll be getting more. One of our sister stations down in Dallas has ten plus aircraft, and they're in basically the the back of every news car. So that again, we're not doing whole stories on it, but if there's a specific need or an instance, they're not having to wait for a crew to come from the station, or 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 you know okay. they can they can work you know step aside from their news duties and their reporting duties and their photographer yeah. duties and become uh, uh, pilots and observers and get the one or two shots they need for what they're looking for and then move on to the piece. And, and you asked about how many pilots we yeah. have. We currently have six pilots uh, uh, and, and those are the ones that are FAA uh, certified. Be, be carry, the hold the part FAA report, the part 107 we can get into, but yeah. basically have the remote pilot certificate and uh, we can get a little deeper into it, but they actually have to have, in our company, we have an additional certification they have to get. It includes a three-day course that we give in, in about our specifics on safety uh, uh, and checklists and uh, mission briefings, all those things. So, and then there are visual observers that we have that, that can be, that are trained to a lesser extent that, that are basically pilot's assistants. Uh, and they work, uh, our company requires uh, uh, visual observers. The FAA says they encourage it, but it's not an absolute requirement uh, for daylight operations. So. so the crew is the actual pilot yep. flying, and then you have a, a second person who's just maintaining visual. Yeah, yes, but uh, in uh, in the Inspire aircraft, every aircraft operates a little differently. The yeah. Inspire aircraft actually there's a second controller, and they're operating okay. the camera. Okay. So uh, the pilots, the pilot's end. job on right. on the Inspire is is right. primarily. Right flying the aircraft and the other ones tends to be heads down looking at the shot okay, right. and they change off they trade off hey you keep your eyes up and <clears throat> the pilot may need to look down at something but somebody always has eyes on the aircraft all right and all right. of course with a small aircraft the, the smaller and again these all change on models you can have the pilot has to basically do all, everything yeah. and your visual observer's job is to be watching the aircraft yeah. and and working with the pilot there but you know i the people i've when i see somebody flying a drone or a, a media a, I've observed it's a lot better with the two-person operation. Absolutely, you got somebody flying the aircraft and somebody's doing the shot. Somebody's somebody's always got their eyes on the aircraft, or yeah. somebody's always concentrating on the aircraft. The other person can deal with okay. other things, and and that's why our our company and you know nationwide, we actually have uh, over a hundred pilots in the company over our our forty-one TV okay. markets that we All have. Right. Well, so, so we're going to come back, yeah, and talk more about that. And for you folks, we're halfway through this show. Hope you found it interesting so far, but we're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about what are the rules, policies that one media company has put in place uh, to protect privacy and make sure that they're doing things according to Hoyle, I guess is the cool idea. So uh, watch this message and we'll be right back. See on page four that the projections need to be earthquake. Next Thursday? Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh-uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So. I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate. Welcome back. If you're just joining us today, uh, we're talking with Greg Thies, the head of the uh, drone pilots at King 5. You know, another title you have, you have about four or five, but one of them is you're in charge of safety. And uh, drones and drone safety is a, it's a, a big, big deal. It's and, a and big deal. And really, all the FAA, we're going to talk more about that, but it all revolves around safety. And it should. And it 
and that's a, it's a good thing. It, when I got asked, it, it, you know, my five or seven day a week job as operations manager at King, yeah. and, and got asked to, and, and became lead pilot. When I became lead pilot, I also then got asked in the company to become, uh, for all our TV stations, there's three of us that administer uh, so that the program's the same across all our TV stations. And how I'm the chief, uh, it's 41 markets and uh, 41 TV markets that we have our, our uh, in probably 30 stations out of those 40 okay. ones to have. Uh, and so the program's the same. And um, I got asked to be chief uh, safety officer for that group. We have a lead pilot or a chief pilot of yeah. the whole program and a program administrator who does other things, uh, you know. That's very similar it, to like an an airline company has a chief pilot and they yeah, have a chief, chief safety, safety officer. So, so not to get too deep in that. So, but from that standpoint, it started from uh, the very beginning of our program. Our company said nobody, and they put out a memo, said nobody's flying drones until you, we fly within this program. You can't just, this is when part 107 came out yeah. a couple years ago, the commercial uh, uh, drone. Uh, no uh, drone cowboys out there. No, no. When when the when the FAA made the 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 use of commercial drones uh, a little more uh, uh, universal uh, with part one of the part 107 rules they issued, um, it, it everybody said stop. Let's do this the right way. And you, as you have had, and yeah. you've had a show about starting a program from scratch, yeah. and we've talked about this at, at conferences and whatnot, uh, with, it's all the same. Everybody wants to have a good foundation. Our foundation is safety. We have a, a three-day session. We have lead pilots at each of our stations. They go through a class. They t every pilot goes through the same uh, situations. Eight hours of classroom and two days in the field. It all revolves around safety, not about how do you fly the aircraft? We, we do that, obviously, you know, we want to make sure they know how to run the aircraft, yeah. but it revolves around mission briefings, which include everything from uh, what's our geography here and what's, what kind of airspace are we working in, uh, what are our limitations, what obstacles, what hazards there are. It's a mission briefing, just like you, a, a lot of pilots go through in the, the manned aircraft right. program. Uh, and it goes, we go through checklists. Every flight has a checklist, um, much like of, of flight right, operations right, on a manned right, aircraft. Right. And, and so we learned all these things actually from a, a, a program back in, uh, in Virginia, Virginia Tech called the Middle of Atlantic Aviation Partnership. It's an FAA uh, UAS test facility. Okay. Um, what's very interesting is that Sinclair, who owns Como, uh, did a very similar thing. They went to the same people and their program is very similar. So all of us, at, at least uh, those of us you know, at Tegna, which is the parent company of King, and Sinclair, parent company of Como, it's very interesting how we've all come from the same roots, and okay. it's all about safety. Okay, all right. And so uh, you know, we talked earlier about helicopters, you know, generally they're 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet. What's the maximum limit for uh, so the, a so media aircraft? Uh, part 107 rule is 400 feet. Yeah. And then there's other limitations. If there's a cloud, you got to be so far below a cloud. It's a, you got to be 500 feet below a cloud. So if it's a, if the cloud is at 600 feet, you can only go, you know, 100 feet off the ground. Okay. But uh, there are also a lot of different rules when you're around, and that has to do with airspace. And not to get too technical, but you know, once you get into airspace that contains airports, there's different rules and and whatnot. But 400 feet is, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and or in what we call Class G airspace. Uh, away from airports, it's it's 400 feet. What additional training do you all do with your pilots that go beyond the Part 107? And and I kind of just I, I kind of jumped ahead of you on that yeah. one, didn't I? Yeah. I I'm sorry I got into that, but it is. I'll go over it again. We do the uh, we do the, they have to get the remote pilot certificate, the FAA uh, remote pilot certificate before they can even start into our training program. Uh, the Tegna training program again is a it's a eight hours of classroom time, which, yeah. we, which we go over all our, it's not back, going back over what the FAA has already tested them on. It's okay. on so our policies and rules. And we all have right. a flight operations okay. manual that talks about that we have to have two observers. And that okay. we have uh, height limitations and distance limitations okay. and those things. We do that plus two days of field training where we go out and, and they do the uh, basic maneuvers. We make sure they know how to operate the aircraft. Okay. The big thing is communication between the crew uh, talking back and forth and saying, uh, you know, uh, it, it has to do with making sure communication is good between the crew. Yeah. So your visual observer and your and your pilot, if I say I've got 87% battery and I don't hear something back, uh, you know, that's not good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was a little surprised when I talked to you that, for instance, you guys don't do live feeds. Well, oh, we do some. This is like six months ago, so well, we, things we, are always we changing. Don't 
put that as our top of our, our list. It's easier and better for the crew to focus on the on safety and visuals and all those things uh, when, and it's sometimes much easier to get the pretty pictures or the impactful pictures uh, when you're just flying the drone, not worrying about live and cues and what time do I hit? Because if you only have a, a 15 minute window and it takes you a certain amount of time to go through the checklist and then you get up yeah. in the air, we do have policies and procedures in our flight operations manager to go live, it's okay. But then we have to, we, we make sure that the pilot is only focused on that, not worrying about TV. Yeah. And, and somebody else is worrying about TV and cues and things of okay. that sort. So we do live, uh, I think one of our very first uh, uh, live uh, was a breaking news out here on I-90 when uh, there was a mudslide, I, I believe a okay. year and a half or so ago right. and closed I-90 down out by east of Issaquah. And we went live, it was very easy. It was obviously yeah. the DOT had closed off the highway. Yeah. So we do live, we try to, to, to limit the amount of that. Yeah. And privacy always comes up. Every so time, what's every up? time. What's the? I, I remember when we first introduced the drone. We introduced the drone on TV, and one of the things we wanted to really make sure everybody understood was privacy is, you know, aside from safety, safety yeah. being number one, privacy uh, is also a key to to ensure that people feel know that we are not invading privacy. And, and it's very tough when you see a drone sitting out there. Uh, they actually just physically have a very wide lens. They can't really they see zoom into in. things, yeah. you know. Uh, the Some of the drones now have zoom, but not to that extent. And of course, we don't use it for any kind of, of anything like that. Anything we would think is uh, what you would reasonably say, and of course, journalists on the street, if something can be seen in the public, it, it can be, you know, not to get deep into photojournalism yeah. rules, but if, it, if you're walking down the street and I can see you and you're out in the public and I'm out in the public and you know I got a camera. And that's open. Yeah, it's open. Now, you know, am I gonna come over your fence, your backyard at 10 feet? And you, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy there. Yeah. If you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So we, that's also part of the discussion we have in our classroom session with our pilots is, 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 is ensuring that we're not trying to push that, that privacy boundary uh, with folks. Like the I-90 footage, yeah. and I think maybe we showed some of that okay. at, at earlier, is did the DOT ask you to be able to see that footage or to get well, a copy of it? That was pretty, uh, we were there, and, and they were, uh, it, it was very interesting because at that point in time, I think the public service agencies, but Washington State Patrol was out and, and Washington State Department of Transportation, they didn't, had not, uh, they didn't had, had not deployed aircraft yeah. themselves to the extent we right. had. Right. So at that point, it was, uh, they were very accommodating, they were good. They were wondering if there was water coming down from where did the slide originate from? Could we go take right. a look? Right. But there was, a, there was some, definitely some collaboration there, but not, uh, I think it was more of just inquisitive uh, to that extent. So what if the fire uh, would be on scene, there's a big blaze going on, uh, they don't have a drone capability. Sal Fire certainly doesn't have, have that. Other local departments might be getting it type of thing, could they ask you to, um, you know, help them? If, if I was better? on scene with somebody and they wanted to look over my shoulder at something, I, we've always tried to work together, even when we're on the ground. Okay. Uh, and we try to be as collaborative as we can be with, with the public service agencies, public safety agencies. Uh, you know, it's easier to do it right there or they can see our live see signal. I know we've talked about that in, uh, even again, in disaster preparedness and in, in uh, emergency management, they can watch our helicopter signals as, as they're coming in, that yeah. sort. Um, it, it can, we haven't run across that situation, but I, I couldn't see, I wouldn't be sitting here holding the controller away from them. I would, of course, want to collaborate, yeah. and, and I think everybody would want to do that too. You know, one of the things FAA is looking at, we got about three minutes left, uh, so briefly, is, you know, they're looking at allowing flight over people, flight beyond direct observation that's being considered now. Uh, how do you see that impacting there what are, you do? And literally as we're sitting here, there are probably the rules are being discussed and changes to the two big ones right now. Uh, and, and there's a, coal, a, a coalition that works with the FAA and those in trying to work this out. Uh, flights over people. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 it, and they're working on a size of drone, What's the, and they're trying to limit, you know, also density of people. It, yeah. It's not a bunch, you know, large gathering, but if it's a small amount of people or people are aware, yeah. or perhaps it's announced in a, a gathering, there'll be a drone over, but the, the physical drone might have to be a certain size. Uh, same thing, flights at night, certain limitations, they, they would put uh, parameters around all those things. 
So at, what do you expect to happen in the near term, maybe not too distant future, concerning operations by media companies? If all that's approved that you just talked about, how would that impact media? And that's kind of our wrap question. I think the, the use will expand. I mean, I just think, again, uh, from a standpoint, it's kind of like Go. I'll use the silly example of a GoPro. Everybody, we used to have one GoPro there. Everybody wanted to borrow it. Now everybody has a GoPro, and they can use that as a tool for that if there's a particular story, an event, really something of that sort. Really, you're storytelling. That's what... It, it is, but that's what we're trying to do. I mean, it's, it's, we work with our public, uh, the public service and public safety agencies if the, you know, to make sure we're not, uh, we all collaborate. If they have drones up, we have drones up. We work together. Everybody's always, uh, we, we try to work with each other because there will only be more and more aircraft out there. And that's, that's where the challenges will be. And I think, you know, deconflicting airspace and working together is the big key to keep us all safe. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh, Greg, this has been that terrific. It goes We fast. could go for an hour. Yes, we could. Two hours. We're not going for <laughs> okay. an hour. So uh, I, it's great to see the level of interest in safety, the level of cooperation between media companies and public, private um, entities, you know, first responders and that. So just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Great and to be here. And your reward is this beautiful disaster this. zone mug that... Uh, Thank you very Take much. Take it to all your disaster scenes, and they'll think this guy's ready. If I just put that on, they already know that my desk is a disaster zone. Yeah. So all right. Well, there. thank you. Thank you very much. And for you people at home, uh, this brings us to the end of our show for today. Thanks for tuning in and learning more about what you and others can do to become better prepared for disasters. We heard all about the media and their use of drones from that perspective. And remember, if you're going to get prepared, today is a good day to start. Have a great day and tune in again soon. Bye-bye.